Welcome to The Heart of the Matter, an Our Place podcast where we look at the issues surrounding homelessness, addiction and mental health on the streets of Greater Victoria. Hi, I'm Stephen Seltzer, Manager of Philanthropy for Our Place Society and welcome to The Heart of the Matter podcast. Um, please welcome Leah Young, Director of Housing and Shelters at Our Place. Um, thank you for taking the time today. Thanks for letting me share all the things we've been learning through housing and shelters. Uh, I'm sure it's a lot. Um, first, I want to respectfully acknowledge the Kwangan speaking people of the Songhees and Esquimalt Nations for their gracious hospitality while we provide programs and services on their ancestral lands. Um, let's get going. So I think the first question I want to ask you is with more people getting to know our place, our services, our programs, the more they realize the scope of our housing. Um, can you start by explaining what kinds of housing and shelter we're providing in, in the region? Yeah, absolutely. We've grown exponentially in our housing department over the last couple of years um, through COVID and the response to COVID. So it's been an exciting time for us. So our department has grown large. <laughs> um, we started with, um, three years ago, we started with uh, our original 45 units of transitional housing above our uh, community center on Pandora. Um, and then we also had a, a My Place, we call it My Place. It's a, a all day, 24 hour shelter where folks can come in and they, there's no end date to them staying there and they work with our staff. And we also had uh, overnight shelter. It was originally located at First Met and those are a sign up nightly um, map program. Then through COVID, we, uh, we were happy to operate three of uh, the larger hotel sites, which, which included Howard Johnson, Comfort Inn, and uh, um, Capital City Center. Now those were all, um, they're temporary COVID response units, but they're turning into um, permanent housing, long-term housing for our folks. And then we also took on, um, Russell Street is another uh, 24 hour, no end date shelter. Uh, that is uh, very similar uh, to my place, um, very popular. And lastly, we um, a, a, a new initiative that we took on was Tiny Homes, which was um, it's based very similar on all our housing programs, and it's um, single units. Uh, but the building itself is very innovative, um, using shipping containers, and it's built quite the community. So that, in a nutshell, those are our housing and our shelter programs. But I do want to say that um, across the board, uh, whether it's a shelter shelter or a night program or a temporary or permanent housing. Uh, we run our program exactly the same. We support our residents, our staff work along our residents and, um, you know, help them get connected to services that they need and support them in their uh, to maintain their housing. Wow. OK, um, so overall, we're providing, I guess there's nine is it nine different housing sites, roughly about nine or ten? There's eight. <laughs> I just had to look to my board and count how many we have. Right. Um, and then we are looking um, uh, quite uh, quite shortly to open up our permanent um, um, purpose built uh, building on Albina Street. Hopefully, fingers crossed. If all the construction finishes up soon, looking at probably February. Okay. And that will. But alongside of that, um, there will be some closures of some of the, uh, the temporary sites. Um, but we're super excited about the new purpose-built building. And one never knows when another, I don't know if the word is opportunity, but uh, mm -hmm. lots of times it was the government that came to us and said, can you manage these housing sites? And uh, basically, as we're a huge safety net and a huge provider to the community, um, if there are other opportunities, we, we usually want to be involved to support our community is that right right from the beginning um I, i've been at um, our place for a very long time um i've uh worked in the community center frontline work and i saw the need for housing and when those opportunities arose um during covid i i really uh you know pushed and luckily we had the support that we could open up those housing sites because that was the number one um question that we always got asked was like, where's our housing? We need housing. And there wasn't the opportunities. And housing is, 
it's more so the supportive housing for folks. Um, yeah, and so we, uh, you know, that's what I, I, you know, it, it, I saw that need, and I really wanted to help support our folks in in that department, and so that's why, yes, if there's something else comes up, I think it would be great. We have quite a, um, a variety of um, housing and shelters, and it's a good continuum, so it's able to um, support folks where they're at in different. Um, in different levels and different areas of um, the support that the, the staff would offer in the site. So from more intensive support at the shelter level to more independent um, support at the at the hotel sites or at the new purpose built housing site. So it's exciting. And I think if there is opportunities, personally, I would want to do it. <laughs> of course, as if the organization wants to jump on board as well. So yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, we'll talk in a minute about the kinds of challenges that people who come into our housing uh, have been facing, fa uh, are facing, but there's challenges that, that you and your, your team face every day. Um, can you talk about one or two of them? Like, Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You, you manage all these facilities, you have different staff, you have uh, different people with different needs. What's it like on a typical day? Yeah. Well, I guess the number one, the top of my head, really, I mean, I think everyone um, across the community is facing the staffing challenges. So number one for me is, you know, the safety of our sites, the safety of our residents, the safety of our staff. And when we're um, faced with, um, the staffing shortages that we are, it, it's really hard to, you know, that's number one for me right now is the challenges. And then our staff, you know, they face all, um, you know, there's, there's, it's a really rewarding um, work, but it also comes with, uh, you know, challenging behaviors that are associated with mental health and addiction. So sometimes it, it, it is a bit um, heavy and, you um, difficult to navigate, but uh, I mean, our staff do a fabulous job, but they are the the day-to-day -day working with folks that have been, you know, um, experience a lot of trauma and, um, and it results in different behaviors. So our staff are great about supporting them, but those behaviors sometimes are difficult to manage themselves. So yeah. uh, what, what kind of things are you looking for when, when you hire someone to, to be a part of the housing team? Well, I mean, most of all, we look for the um, uh, mental health and addiction support worker certificate. It usually gives them a good start into, uh, you know, knowledge and background knowledge of, um, you know, trauma informed practice um the knowledge of mental health and addictions and you know um how to navigate through that uh they um know the um resources around the community and how to navigate those resources de-escalation techniques great communicator great listener so there's lots of skills and and knowledge but it 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 can be varied from different backgrounds and so um we have a great uh teams at each of the sites and they all bring different uh levels of knowledge and different skills to the table to help support our residents and and build those teams right and, and you've mentioned uh, uh quite a few few of the clients we work with have mental health and addictions challenges but i would think based on you know the last couple of years especially anyone can find themselves in a situation where um, you know, they had one housing one day, they had a job, things are, are changing incredibly. I, I would assume we're seeing just a wide variety of the community looking for housing. And I, I expect over the next couple of years, it will continue. So, you know, they talk about the recession and I think Victoria is a little bit of a bubble, but, you know, I heard somewhere that, you know, we, we expect to see the, um, re the effects in about 18 months. So then my head, that's what I'm kind of thinking, but yes, we have, folks of all different, you know, um, all different experience they've had in life and have found themselves and um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be mental health or addiction. So we we do, that's what our staff do to really find out, um, get to know um, the resident and then they can connect them with those services that they may need. It may need to be connected to um, uh, income assistance or, um, uh, you know, maybe it is to get connected to a doctor or support services with counseling. So that that's really our goal is to get to know the resident, to find out what their support needs are and 
and then to navigate those services. Um, when someone say is on the streets uh, and then looking to be housed, what kind of steps do they go through? Who who helps them to 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 find uh, a shelter or housing? Um, what I always suggest and my advice is uh, our department is housing department, so we don't necessarily work with connecting folks right from the right from out in the streets or in the camps, but we lean on our. Um, our uh, outreach team at the community center at 919. We refer people to go connect with them, fill out the housing, um, the BC housing, supportive housing referral form. Um, and then from there, we also can um, get them to fill out a form for some of our shelters. So there's the nightly sign up overnight mat program. So if they're in need of a, a roof over their head that night, right away, we can get try to get them on that um, list for the overnight um, MAP program, or even into one of our shelters like My Place or uh, Russell Street. So it's a bit of a process of walking through where we can get them, get them in right away as fast as we can. And then from there, sometimes there's a bit of a time before they can go from the shelter into uh, a supportive um, site, such as one of the hotels or Albina Street. So um, that's where we uh, lean on our outreach team to do those system navigation. Now, from what you've explained to me in the past, the ideal would be someone, for example, comes off the streets into a nightly shelter and then is able to transition into a, a longer term shelter, maybe a, their own room, uh, longer term, and then after that, uh, maybe even supportive housing or consider Albina, which is long term housing. And then if they fall off, for example, they don't end up back on the streets. Maybe they end up back in a shelter. And I know that in some European countries, that's, you know, the preferred way. I know when COVID hit, it, it was a crisis to get people off of the streets. But I think the way you've explained to me would be the ideal. Is that right? Um, uh, yeah, with broad brushstroke, yes. I know some people they're ready to go into housing right away, and and but some people we do need to get them connected with services and get them um, ready um, to go into the housing site. So what we do is usually if they are, um, if we can get them into my place or Russell Street, the team will work with them to get them connected with those services, such as the income assistance. Um, uh, uh, it, all those, um, if they needed some more um, support with uh, getting connected with the doctors or nurses. So that's where we will initially do those intensive support and, and um, uh, work with the, the resident. And then once we, um, once that, the, that individual's ready, we, we, we work with the coordinated access and assessment team to make sure that they're moved quickly from those shelter sites into the more long-term housing. I assume some go through this two or three times before they do succeed in housing because um, they aren't ready, they, they have um, trauma they have to deal with, um, all, all sorts of situations. So uh, everyone's in a different situation for the kind of housing they can receive. What, what are a couple of common challenges that people are seeing before they can be put into housing? Um, you know, like all of us are, we, you know, attaining our goals is not always linear. So sometimes we take one step forward, two steps back. Um, the good thing about um, the ability for us to work with our residents, if they do move into housing and there are some setbacks, we do have the shelters that have more support wrapped around them. And so we can um, not, um, we can support them by uh, moving them back to shelter and to support them and get them prepared again to move forward and not ever lose housing and not ever be back onto the street. We try our best to, um, you know, uh, work with the resident and what would what they need at that moment. And we would then can help them, you know, maintain that uh, housing, however it looks like for them and what works best for them. So sometimes it's not necessarily a closed door unit with a kitchen. A lot of our folks at our shelter sites love the community. There's such a great, um, strong community built at Russell Street in my place because everybody's working together. And sometimes it is lonely when you move into a hotel um, setting or a single unit setting because it's not as tight of a community or as close knit community. So people find it challenging. So um, we do really uh, leverage our shelter sites 
because we can use that um, to the residents' advantage and and what they really need. You mentioned um, Albina Street, uh, new permanent housing facility, which is really exciting for us. Um, what do we need to see from residents before we think that they can transition into a, a, a long-term housing solution like that? Well, um, I have to say it's not only just our decision. We work with the coordinated access and assessment system that works throughout the city for all our supportive housing sites with different agencies. So we work with the folks um, on that team to go through the, um, you know, the, the referrals that have come in. Um, because that site's more independent, it has kitchens, um, and um, it, it its location. Uh, we work with that uh, CAA team, coordinated access and assessment team, to find um, the best candidates that uh, have have come forward in their in their referral. Um, that being said, we are working with. Um, to close down the temporary site of Howard Johnson. And some of our Howard Johnson folks um, will be moving on to Albina. Um, so it's a bit of a mix. It, it, it works all through the coordinate access and assessment system. Okay, two more quick questions. One's, uh, I don't know if you'd consider one a negative and one a positive. Uh, in terms of the negative, uh, when the government first uh, purchased a lot of hotels and we were able to transition people into them, the feeling was that we would alleviate a lot of the, the homelessness situation in Greater Victoria, but we're still seeing a lot of people on the streets. Uh, can you chat about, like you yourself, were you feeling like we hit a good uh, landmark opportunity, people are off the streets, and were you surprised when we saw that there's still as much of a crisis as there was? Um, I think, you know, uh, when we, uh, two years ago, um, two and a half years ago, whatever it is now, um, we uh, took in over 400 people in a very, very short period. Um, super exciting and um, definitely important. And, um, what we saw, though, that there is still folks um, experiencing mental health and addictions, and that's really we have to look and as and address the root causes of mental health and addictions. It's not just the housing piece; it's also the mental health and addictions piece. So until we address all of it together, I don't think we'll see the the. Um, it, I don't think we'll see as big of a change as it is if we just say, here's here's 400 units, let's get everybody into 400 units, because it's not just that simple piece of um, finding the shelter. It's a start. It's a start where we we're able to make those connections and help um, folks with the services they need and help folks to maintain their housing. But they're still experiencing, you know, the root causes of what, um, you know, from mental health and addiction. So that's the piece that needs to also come alongside. Now, I know health authority is working to um with making changes as well, but we've got to get caught up and uh, align both of them to really um to make a, I guess, a, a dent in the in the in the issue and 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 a visible dent. So. And in spite of all of that and the challenges that you face every day, uh, which must be huge, um, can you talk about some of the positive change you've seen? Uh, I, I know I've heard stories of people who've come into the shelters from the streets, uh, and, and then if you were to take a picture of, of of their faces when they walk in versus you know a month later and and. The huge difference you're you and positive change you're seeing in people are are you still seeing that oh yeah i mean that's why my staff and myself come in every single day to work because of um all the inspiration and hope that we see through our residents um the changes that they've taken and it's not huge change sometimes it's just the little changes you know they work um staff work alongside the residents so closely and to see those changes um it really it, it inspires us. Um, like you said, when we at all our sites, we um, upon intake, when everybody comes in and we show them around and orientate the sites, we take a photo. So we have a resident list. So we know um, who's in the shelter or in the housing. And if you look back on uh, in a couple of months, the 
the change in the physical change in the in and how they're looking because they're having you know three meals a day they are um sheltered and warm and getting the services they need it's extraordinary like it's extraordinary um so uh not only that we just um working with folks and hearing their stories and they're so resilient and um uh just on monday we had a staffing shortage so myself and our manager went in to work an overnight um, shift. There was no other staff, but it was just the two of us. And the residents of my place were so uh, loving. They said, well, who are you? <laughs> and they came in and they said, well, this is how you make coffee. Everyone was helping us out. And it wasn't like, you know, a negative at all. And they were so helpful and wanting to show um, their community they had built there. So, so it makes me come to work every day, um, work through all this challenges that we do face and you know um I, I wouldn't be anywhere else awesome that's great thanks so much leah appreciate your being part of this yeah thanks so much for having me you've been listening to the heart of the matter podcast for more information about our place and the vital programs and services provided to the greater victoria community please go to www.ourplacesociety.com our place is a registered bc charity you can donate by visiting the website or by calling 250-940-5060. Help us to bring hope and belonging to those in need.